Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, getting up early on a Saturday morning to join us for this uh, symposia. Um, we have a very nice uh, set of uh, um, talks set up for today's symposium on uh, 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 nano agents that are being advanced to the clinic. So we're excited to hear from our speakers. Uh, we've got just a couple of things to discuss before we start the session. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you'd uh, uh, turn off your cell phones. There's plenty of room, seating room, so if you all want to make this intimate and move up forward, uh, please feel welcome to do so. Um, and please uh, limit photography. Um, uh, that can be uh, pretty annoying to the speakers, especially if you have the flash mode on, or, um, and really the ASGTC uh, uh, discourages it um, heavily. So um, we have a, a nice range of talks today that will cover um, high throughput nanoparticle design um, um, through uh, uh, preclinical studies for applications of um, 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 CRISPR uh, technologies using nanoparticles, and then wrapping up with some um, uh, personalized or individualized uh, RNA therapies for cancer, a uh, great set of speakers, and we're looking forward to it. So um, without further ado, we can start with the first talk. Our first speaker is uh, James Dahlman from uh, Georgia Tech uh, Institute in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, and he's going to uh, talk to us about his new system of barcoding nanoparticles uh, with a high throughput in vivo analysis system. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is <clears throat> James Dolman. I'm assistant professor at, at Georgia Tech in the biomedical engineering department. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming out this morning. Uh, I know it's early. I know there was a party last night, so I really appreciate uh, you guys coming out to see this. Um, today I'm going to be describing um, some work that I'm pursuing in my lab that we actually find pretty exciting. Um, hopefully by the end of the talk, at least a few of you will be convinced that maybe this is an exciting approach uh, to study nanoparticles in a new way. Um, and the approach is really focused on how can we study a lot of nanoparticles uh, directly in vivo in order to identify uh, promising new candidates. Um, so disclosure slide, uh, I do have patents related to LMP delivery that have been issued and are pending. Um, so just as a brief discovery, I, I know we're at a brief uh, discussion here, I know we're at a drug delivery conference and a cell therapy conference, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, we're talking about drug delivery here, and I'm specifically going to be talking about systemic uh, delivery, although the methodologies that we're uh, describing can be applied to other uh, routes of administration as well. Uh, the second thing, uh, again, uh, this is you know a slide I'm going to kind of breeze through for you guys, but um, I, I've been in the drug delivery field since 2009. Um, I did my PhD with Bob Langer over at MIT, and at the time, the, the field of at least siRNA delivery uh, was in a different state than it is now. Uh, and now it's getting extremely exciting in people. And this is a slide now that's actually quite old, but I always like to show it because this is the first time I saw clinical data and just went, oh my God. Uh, because what you see here, uh, th these are data from Mount Island. This is liver targeting siRNA, and I've sort of modified uh, the axes here just for simplicity. But what you see here is uh, target gene expression in people dropping uh, nearly 100% for a very long time, up to 120 days after uh, administration. And this is just incredible. I think this demonstrates that at least in liver, uh, RNAi therapies are moving really in the right direction. And with uh, this isn't the latest stuff. You know, as you guys know, if you're following this field, uh, more promising data, data that extends out to even six months after subcutaneous injection have recently been reported. So we get really robust silencing in people using siRNA. Uh, as somebody who does siRNA delivery, this is extremely exciting work. Uh, but today we're going to be focusing, again, on, on drug delivery and systemic drug, drug delivery of, of RNA therapies. I'm going to be focused on two questions. The first half of the talk is stuff we've done in the past. So how have I and others uh, discovered and characterized different nanoparticles? The second half of the talk is dedicated to the stuff that's a lot newer. And this is focused on uh, a simple question which is not uh, how can I develop a new chemistry or this chemistry or that chemistry. Instead, how can I significantly improve the process of nanoparticle discovery uh, such that people with chemistry X or chemistry Y or chemistry Z uh, can also accelerate their discovery of nanoparticles as well. And the idea that I'm going to put forward today is that uh, maybe is, is relatively simple. Uh, maybe we can just test a lot of them uh, directly in vivo. So when I look at the uh, RNA delivery field and I look at the clinical data that's been generated so far, the most convincing clinical data I think uh, many people would agree with this, has been generated in the liver. And so when I think about uh, the rest of the body, there are a lot of different uh, cellular targets 
uh, that may be of interest outside the liver for a variety of therapies, whether they be mRNA or SI or microRNA or long nose coding or CRISPR or zinc finger or talon, whatever you want. Um, <clears throat> the stuff that I've done historically has been focused on non-liver delivery and specifically has been focused on the delivery of nanoparticles uh, that have siRNA in them uh, to endothelial cells. And I'm not going to go into the endothelial cell biology portion of my talk, but suffice it to say that uh, you know, endothelial cells are really interesting uh, cell types. So when I started my PhD, I was doing my PhD in material science at MIT, um, <clears throat> and I thought that endothelial cells were just tubes. Essentially, the blood flowed through them. They were there. They were pretty or whatever, but they didn't have any, any sort of interesting function. And that was completely wrong. So endothelial cells are interesting for a lot of reasons. Uh, number one, there's heterogeneity across different organs. So if you take, you know, like an average endothelial cell in your lung and you compare that to an average endothelial cell in your heart, they're, they're different from one another. There's heterogeneity across organs. Uh, not only that, there's actually heterogeneity within an organ. So if you take, a, you know, a, an endothelial cell that's lining a vein in your heart and you compare that to an endothelial cell that's lining an artery in your heart, those are also very different. Um, so scientifically, they're really interesting because the function, the sort of cell type specific function of different vascular beds is, is pretty um, poorly understood right now. The second reason they're interesting is because they're everywhere and they play very active roles in disease. So they take stuff out of the bloodstream, they secrete stuff to the bloodstream, they talk to their neighbors, they affect the microenvironment, they do a lot of stuff. And so if you cross that fact with the fact that they are literally, you know, essentially everywhere in the body, you can see that they're implicated in many diseases, whether it be heart disease, neurological, cancer, metastasis, and so on. Okay, uh, we've done a lot of work on endothelial cell delivery. This is just a cartoon. Uh, I'll get into the more, you know, sort of serious silencing data later, but this is basically a tagged siRNA in red, um, coating a mouse ear vasculature in blue. I like to show this figure because I think it's pretty, uh, so that's it. Uh, the thing that I really care about more than distribution, which is, you know, we've measured both with uh, histology and also with uh, fact sorting and all these sorts of things. We measure distribution a lot of ways. But the thing I'm really interested in is sort of functional delivery, because a particle can go somewhere and not work there. And I think many of you guys have probably agree with that statement. So in this case, these, these are some data that we generated that started getting us pretty uh, jazzed up about siRNA delivery to endothelial cells. And, and for those of you who've done SI work, I, I think the, the really interesting part about this is, is the x-axis. So what you're seeing here is, is essentially the dose of administered SI. This is intravenous administration. This is to mice. And what you see is a log 10 plot. And so down here, you can see pretty robust silencing somewhere between 80 and 95% uh, mRNA silencing uh, in vivo after an administered dose of 0.01 uh, to 0.02 megs per keg, um, which is pretty good for, for non-liver silencing. Um, we see this across different vascular beds, although the long vasculature is, is targeted uh, most efficiently. Uh, and we've seen this uh, in a bunch of different genes. So, uh, again, I'm not going to go over in detail our endothelial work, but, um, it, again, sort of suffice it to say that we've, we've <coughs> had this particle work in about 15 different labs now across the states, and we see data like this pretty, consistent, pretty consistently. So this is just from our original Nature Nano paper demonstrating that we can get, you know, very potent mRNA silencing uh, using different genes, uh, again, as sort of in vivo. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting about um, sort of low-dose siRNA delivery is, if you think about it this way, the, you know, the particle, as I just showed you, I'm going to flip back a slide here. I can put in siRNA that targets V you could hear in, and I can get V you could hear in silencing. I can put in an SI that targets ICAM2, and I can get ICAM2 silencing. So the particle, when you're talking about swapping out siRNA sequence, doesn't care that much what the actual specific sequence is. So I can deliver gene A, or I can deliver gene B. So what does that mean? That means I can also deliver gene A and B at the same time. And so uh, this is, again, sort of a cross-sectional image of one of our particles as a cryo-TEM when the particle is carrying one SI, and this is a cross-sectional TEM of a particle that's carrying five different SIs simultaneously. We have actual data with DLS spectra and stuff, but I like the images. Um, and what we've seen over and over and over is that I can formulate a particle with one SI, so gene A, or I can formulate the particle with A, B, C, D, and E, um, and you can get particles that don't really change. What that allows you to do is to do sort of complex in vivo genetics. So this STM paper that came out last year, uh, in this paper we showed that we could co-deliver five different siRNAs simultaneously to endothelial cells and, and heart and get sort of complex uh, multi-gene silencing uh, directly in vivo. And the reason why this is interesting is because there are many diseases uh, that are not monogenic, uh, where you might want to turn off uh, more than one gene 
uh, once, and this is the case in atherosclerosis, uh, which is the gene, which is the uh, disease that we targeted here. <clears throat> um, the multi-gene silencing can actually be pretty robust. So, uh, on this figure here at the bottom, uh, what you're seeing is is in vivo mRNA silencing. Um, after nanoparticles that carried five different SI, siRNA simultaneously uh, were administered to mice. And the thing I just want to focus on here is that this, this number on the x-axis, that's the total siRNA dose. So in this case, if we have a 0 0.25 meg per keg uh, dose and we have five SIs, the average administered dose is, uh, is 0 0.05 megs per keg per SI. And so you can see even at a 0 0.25 total dose, we get between 60 and 80% silencing in all five target genes. And uh, once you increase the 0 0.5 total dose, we got something like 80% silencing in, in all five target genes. So we can do multi-gene silencing, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, the other thing I'd just like to point out is, is I spent a lot of time as a PhD student um, doing a lot of work I, never, I, I knew was never going to go into any publication. And what I mean by that is I spent a lot of time um, optimizing this particle formulation so it worked every single time in our hands. Uh, and the particle size was the same every single time, uh, both when we synthesized different chemical batches and when we formulated it on different days and so on and so forth. That was probably about six months of just sort of boring traditional engineering work. Um, but I, I, I do have to say I think it was good that we did this work because uh, we've been able to ship this particle out to different labs across the country and since 2014. These are the publications that have utilized uh, the particle, um, you know, and so it doesn't just work in our hands. It works in the hands of essentially uh, all the labs who've tried to test it uh, so far, which is kind of cool. Um, so in the vascular biology community, this, this particle, which is 7C1, is becoming a little bit more prevalent um, as people want to do more and more uh, complex in vivo genetic studies. Okay, so that's the stuff that we've done historically, and I kind of zoomed through that a bit, but again, the summary is that um, we have developed a nanoparticle that, that targets endothelial cells and delivers siRNAs at very low doses. Um, it's worked in a bunch of labs and we can do multi-gene silencing. We can get silencing for a few weeks at a time after administration. Um, and my background is in essentially non-liver delivery. <clears throat> so now I want to get to the stuff that we're working on now that, that's a little more exciting to me. Um, and this is a pretty simple question. So how, how do we discover nanoparticles? And this is the historical approach. This is the, the, the approach I, I took to find that 7C1 particle. Uh, I made a lot of particles. Um, I think I tested 2,500 um, as a first year PhD student. Uh, this is a true story. We had a robot to do this. I don't know if any of you guys saw Professor Langer's talk yesterday, but the, he, he showed this robot that, that makes stuff for you. Professor Langer's lab is very large. Uh, and the robot was on the other side of the lab. Uh, and I did not know we had a robot as a first year grad student. So I actually made these things by hand. And I gave my first talk in the group meeting and I said, oh, blah, blah, blah. And basically somebody said, hey, you know, how'd the robot work out for you? And I said, <laughs> what robot? So, so the first thing, uh, oh, by the way, I tell that story to my students since I can't afford a robot. So, mm -hmm. um, all right. So, you know, but I made uh, thousands of particles. And, and this isn't unique to me. I'm not any kind of special chemist. Many people across the world can make tens of particles or hundreds of particles or even Dan Siegward, ET Southwestern, who's this brilliant chemist uh, who did his PhD in ATRP stuff at, at Carnegie Mellon, um, can synthesize up to 10,000 different particles. He has a robot, now he's at ET Southwestern running his own lab. Um, a lot of people can synthesize a lot of particles. Um, but once you synthesize them, everybody does the same thing. If you make 1,000 of them, you have to test 1,000 of them directly in vitro. And then you take a very small number. In my case, it's usually one to three. In the 7C1 case, we tested five or six in vivo. Uh, and then you, I'm not being coy here. I think this is true. You basically, you're not quite sure if it's going to work, so you really hope it does. Um, and then if you find something that, that works pretty well, then you, re, you sort of rigorously, uh, rigorously characterize whatever winner you found through the in vitro screen. Um, so this is a picture of one of the libraries that, that I handmade. Um, and what this shows is just we can make a lot of different chemical compounds. Again, I'm not the world's greatest chemist by any stretch. So this is actually, there are a lot of chemistries that you can use to make stuff like this. Um, so each vial here is a different chemical compound. And this is just 600 of them shown uh, at once. And, and, and like in my lab now, even at Georgia Tech, we can probably make 100 of these a day. Uh, it'd be very easy to scale up to two or 300 a day without any problem. 
Uh, the problem is that we take that big library, and if I want to do, again, let's say non-liver delivery, um, let's say I want to do something in the cardiopulmonary thing. So I've done a lot of heart and lung work. Let's say I wanted to stay in heart and lung. So this is what I'm trying to hit. I'm trying to hit either the vasculature in this or maybe cardiomyocyte or, God forbid, the pulmonary epithelium or, or something like this. This is what I'm trying to hit after an intravenous injection. And I'm trying to find a particle that avoids stuff in the bloodstream, that avoids the kidney, avoids the liver, does its best to get here. And the way that I'm testing it is I'm pipetting it directly onto usually uh, human cancer cell lines in a dish. And this isn't uh, meant to diminish uh, any of this work, obviously. I've done this work. Um, it just means that when I look at this honestly, you know, I got to that, the end of that 7C1 screen, I realized that we, we kind of got lucky and we found something that worked here. Um, but I realized that we might be uh, able to develop a, a process that's much more efficient and representative of, of the in vivo delivery process. And so specifically, I realized there are a few things that were uh, kind of annoying to me. So <clears throat> I tested 2,500 things in vitro, and I found a winner after I tested six in vivo, which meant a few things. Number one, I wasn't able to study how the 7C1 nanoparticle structure affected delivery. So, you know, I don't know if it's a C15 epoxide. I don't know if it's a PEI 600, not PEI 25,000, PEI 600, so it's really OEI. Uh, I didn't know if it was a peg that we added. I didn't know if it was a lack of cholesterol. Um, because if I wanted to explore the chemical space around 7C1 really in a detailed way, I'd probably have to make another 100 or 150 formulations, which is a close to a 1,000 mouse experiment with five mice a group. <clears throat> the other thing is that there are 2,494 7C1 analogs that have been untested in vivo. And so as a result, um, if you put a gun to my head and said, hey, I want you to make a great pancreatic delivery vehicle, or hey, that 7C1 particle really prefers the lung, I want you to do cerebral endothelium so we can go after some neurological stuff, um, I would have to start from scratch. I have to make a big library again, I have to screen again, and I'd have to basically put them in and focus on brain endothelium or something like this. So I, it's very difficult for me to learn uh, from these very massive and very large and very expensive in vitro studies. The other reason that uh, I think, the other thing I think is important to really highlight here is, is when we talk about the chemical space um, related to nanoparticle discovery, I showed you 600 vials, right? <clears throat> Each vial represents one of these red things, right? For every given red thing, I can either add cholesterol or not. I can add DOTAP or not. I can add DOPE or not. I can add them in different ratios. I can add PEG that has 5,000 molecular weight or 500 molecular weight with a C14 lipid on it or C18 lipid on it. I think by last count, uh, I counted somewhere between 20 and 30 reasonable PEGs that I could just order off the shelf. When you start doing this, and we know, by the way, that each one of these factors affects the delivery. So I know that if you take a particle and you replace cholesterol with DOTAP, the particle is going to behave differently. Or if you replace the cholesterol with DSPC, the particle is going to behave differently. So if Dan Siegwer can make 10,000 red things, or I can make 200 red things a day with a small lab at Georgia Tech, and for every red thing I can make a few hundred particles, you start realizing that this chemical space is vast, and if we find a winner, it's very hard to pin down exactly why that winner won, if that makes sense. So this is, a, I think, sort of a summary of, of my experience for the first few years of, of my time in the LMP world. <laughs> uh, and I'm not trying to be coy or colloquial or, you know, be, you know, anything like this, uh, this is very true, and I, I mean this. When I screen uh, nanoparticles, and I spend a year of my life screening things in vitro, and then I go in vivo and it doesn't work, um, that's really annoying to me, especially as a new PI with limited funds. This is extremely annoying to me, right? Um, and so I wanted to test a pretty simple hypothesis, which is, which is, you know, by testing a bunch of different nanoparticles directly in vivo, could we improve uh, delivery? So this is a methodology, honestly, that, that I would like. Um, this is a, this sort of dream methodology. I want to still make thousands of particles because uh, I'm not sure what chemical space is best yet. Uh, I don't know why that's off center. I apologize for that. Um, I want to test them all directly in vivo. And really importantly here, um, let's say I want to target cerebral endothelium. I want to do brain endothelium. I don't want to just measure delivery to brain endothelium. I also want to measure delivery to the off-target tissues that we know clear particles out. So 
a lot of particles get cleared out by liver, kidney, spleen, macrophages, stuff like this. So I want to be able to measure delivery to a bunch of different tissues and cell types all simultaneously. Because if I screen 500 particles in vivo and particle 37 is best in brain endothelium, but particle 37 also gets distributed a lot in liver, kidney, spleen, that may not be the best particle. Uh, or if particle 37 goes to brain endothelium and also goes to heart, lung, liver endothelium, uh, and I really, really need it to be preferentially delivered to brain as much as it can be, then maybe particle 48, which is less good in brain but also is really terrible in the other vascular beds, may be a better choice. So I want to be able to deliver, I want to be able to measure across any combination uh, and any number of off-target tissues simultaneously, and I want to get everything at once. So I'm, I'm being pretty greedy here. But then once we, once we go, get done with this process, uh, I then want to do traditional stuff. I want to be able to ID, identify that lead candidate and do exactly the same thing we've been doing 7C1. So what I'm not proposing is taking a, a multi-thousand nanoparticle library screen and going directly to a pharma company and saying, look, I did one experiment, we're ready to go to the clinic. What I mean is I want to take a multi-thousand nanoparticle screen and I'm gonna get, I want to get to a better top five list. That's all I'm asking for. I still want to test the top five, do talks, do dose response, do repeat administration, blah, 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 all that stuff. But I just want to get to a better top five thing so I have a better chance of success in that top five list. So how do we do this? Well, we had a paper just came out, PNAS, um, that describes a methodology to do this. All you viral people are sighing in your minds. I know, I know, I, I know. Viral people have been doing barcoding stuff forever, uh, but it's, it, we'll get into the reasons why it's been harder for us non-viral folks to do it. But the methodology is relatively simple. You basically take a, a rationally designed DNA barcode, you formulate it so that the particle, instead of carrying an SI, is carrying the barcode. You do this a lot during the day. Um, so uh, you make a bunch of different pooled barcodes. Each one has its, uh, excuse me, barcoded nanoparticles. So nanoparticle one has barcode one. Nanoparticle two is barcode two. Nanoparticle three is barcode three. You do this all separately. My lab can do about 300 in a day right now. You then do a very uh, intense quality control. So before you pool them together, you make sure that they're very high quality particles. So we have a lot of quality controls put in place so that if I make 300, uh, you know, I only put in the X number that are great particles, that are stable, that are small, uh, that aren't going to mix together. So we have a lot of quality controls. <clears throat> After the quality controls, we take the particles that are of high quality, we pull them together, and we can administer them to um, any combination of cells, uh, animals, whatever you want. And then you can basically deep sequence and identify uh, the barcodes that have been distributed and get these nanoparticle targeting heat maps both in vitro uh, and in vivo. And just before we start getting into the actual data, um, I want to give a brief description of what you're going to see on the y-axis the whole time. You're going to see normalized delivery, normalized delivery. And what I mean by normalized delivery is this. So, so we do these, these pooled screens and we sequence a lot of different samples on the same uh, Illumina run. Uh, and so uh, what we do is to, to identify normalized delivery is, let's say I'm going to go back a slide here. Let's say I had these three particles. I had this red barcoded particle, the green one, and the gray barcoded particle. <clears throat> let's say, you know, I, I administer this to some cells on a dish and I administer it to a mouse. Um, once I sequence the cells, they're their own thing. And so I just count all the DNA reads in the cells and I say, okay, I saw six pieces of DNA that were barcodes uh, in the cells. Three, two of them are gray, two of them are green, two of them are red. So it was a 33% uh, normalized delivery for each particle. That's what I mean by normalized delivery. Separately, if I go to the endothelial cells and I see something different uh, with this sample, if I see uh, you know, one gray barcode, four green barcodes, and a red barcode, then I get this distribution. So this is what we mean. Every sample is its own thing, and we basically make a pie chart for every individual sample. So there were a lot of steps that went into this. Um, I think, you know, when, when, when this idea was generated, we said, oh, okay, you know, this idea is so simple, I can't believe nobody's done this before, blah, blah, blah. And then over the course of about two years, we figured out why nobody done it before. It took a lot of uh, engineering. So we had to rationally design the, the DNA barcode, which is different from an AAV barcode. We had to, we already had the high throughput chemistry, so that's kind of a, a straw man. Uh, we had to develop very high throughput, robust nanoparticle formulations. So if you're going to barcode a bunch of particles, they can't be bad. So how do you make 100 particles in a day and then make sure that they're all good and do quality control stuff? Um, and then how do you amplify these small barcodes out of cells and tissues? And how do you optimize this so it's robust and you don't get PCR bias and blah, blah, blah. This took a lot of time. 
Um, but the stuff I want to focus on now is actually data analysis once we've done all this work uh, and, and describe some controls so hopefully at least by the time that uh, this talk is done you can believe at least half of what I said. That's my goal. All right, so the first control that we did, the first experiment that we did was uh, sort of sanity check controls. We, we took three particles with, with known activity, excuse me, two particles with known activity and then one negative control. So the negative control was just naked DNA, uh, which shouldn't deliver very effectively at all in vivo. And then we took a liver targeting particle, and then we took that 7C1 particle, and we mixed them together, so we had three barcodes, and we administered, the, administered them to mice and then looked at normalized delivery uh, in lung, and we saw what we expected, which is basically the naked DNA uh, did, sort of did a terrible job, which is what we'd expect. The liver particle did much better than naked DNA, but the lung particle outperformed the liver particle. So that was a good first step, so we were happy with this. Uh, we did another control experiment where we had an optimized uh, lung targeting particle. Uh, we had a lung targeting particle that was made to be unstable, and then we had a bunch of stuff that we didn't know was gonna happen. And then we administered 10 of them. These are 10 different barcoded particles together. And we saw what happened. And again, the positive control popped out and the negative control fell out, which is cool. We've done more stuff in my lab where we've actually administered up to, uh, well, a lot of particles simultaneously. And then we spike in a negative control. All the red, all the black dots are all of our different LMPs, LMP1, LMP10, LMP86, whatever it is. And then we spike in one naked barcode. And we've done this for several dozen tissues now and every single, across five or six different experiments. And every single time, you can, you can literally see in the heat map one red line going across. You can physically see the negative control before you even go in and back check it. And this is just one sample out of a few dozen we get in a simple experiment where the naked barcode just drops out every single time. Um, one of the other experiments, there are error bars on this guy. Uh, the data are just very uh, tight. Uh, one of the experiments that we had done previously was we said, okay, we weren't sure if this stuff was, if the readouts are gonna be linear. So after we convinced ourselves that the naked barcode kept falling out, and the negative controls were working and some of the positive controls were working. We said, okay, well, are these data linear? And one of the things that we did was we said, okay, well, how can we test that? It's actually very hard to, to sort of test. So we said, okay, was we're gonna, instead of barcoding different particles, different formulations, we're gonna barcode the same formulation different times. So I'm gonna take particle one and put DNA barcode one in it. I'm gonna take particle one separately and put DNA two in it separately take particle one and put DNA three in it. And I'm gonna do this seven times. And I'm gonna mix them together to form a standard curve. So particle one with barcode seven is gonna be administered at a dose of 0 0.05, or sorry, 0.5 megs per keg. And particle one with barcode one is gonna be administered at 0 0.0001 meg per keg. And then the stuff in the middle. So it's an in vivo standard curve. That's the DNA input. And then we basically read the DNA output and what you see is basically a nice uh, straight line. So these data suggested to us uh, that, that we were getting what we sort of expected. One of the big concerns, and still one of the big concerns I have moving forward, because this will not be the same case for every nanoparticle library, is whether particles mix in solution. So the question is, if I have to barcode these particles and then co-administer them, if I have barcode one and nanoparticle one, and I have barcode two and nanoparticle two, are they gonna mix together? And so I cannot stand up here and say they will never mix, right? What I can say is we have put in controls to identify when particles have mixed because different chemistries are gonna act differently. So in this experiment, we, we developed one of these controls. So what we did is we said, okay, we're gonna take nanoparticles that are known to be very stable. So these are really well-behaved nanoparticles. Uh, one targets the liver, and then we had three different lung targeting formulations. And we're gonna barcode them separately and administer them to mice. So we did that. And then what we did is we, we made too much barcode. So we took the barcode and we set it out on the bench top for 24 hours. And then we injected the same solution to four new mice the next day. And we said, okay, if there's some mixing in here, then this is gonna look different in the mice that we inject the next day. And so these are the mice that we injected the next day. And basically what you see is that there's no difference uh, between them. So what I can say based on these data is that these barcodes did not mix. Functionally, they did not mix. So that's kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> we did a lot of other control experiments. The whole PNAS paper isn't even a scaling up thing. It's just literally a bunch of control experiments um, to show that the data were robust uh, or the, that the system is robust. But anyway, um, this is one of the sort of cool experiments we did in that paper which is this is a, an in vivo targeting heat map. So this is 30 different nanoparticles administered simultaneously. So each column is a different nanoparticle. And then this is eight different tissues. 
Uh, and these sort of data allow you to do stuff that's kind of interesting. You can see things that you may not be able to see by testing things one at a time. For instance, these particles are all terrible. This particle does really well all over the place. And if I wanted to target these two tissues, I might want to look at this particle. Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting is that, at least in this experiment, these tissues, one, two, three, four, five, tended to be transfected by the same types of particles. <coughs> Um, we can also do high throughput in vivo, in vivo pharmacokinetics. So I actually made this figure. There were 30 particles that we tested where we did in vivo pharmacokinetics on all 30. Um, it gets really ugly, frankly, if you show all 30. So this is just 10 that we selected. But you can see different particles have different uh, pharmacokinetic profiles. And then you can do this, use this to calculate high throughput area under the curve stuff for pharmacokinetics uh, as well. And then finally, you can do pretty obvious stuff. Like you can say, all right, um, I want to study how material property X affects delivery to Y. And so you can vary, in this case, this was a peg lipid length or something. Uh, and we can see that as we increase peg lipid length, we get increased delivery to the brain in this experiment. So again, I am not saying that C18 peg is the sort of the end all and be all for brain delivery. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that if somebody said to me, hey, I want to go after cerebral endothelium, and I have a limited amount of resources to target cerebral endothelium, and I have to choose a peg, I'm going to choose this peg to start my library. That's what I'm saying. All right, so uh, great. A minute and a half, I'm good to go. So basically, what have we discussed today? Uh, first half is how we discovered and characterized particles and how can we improve this process. And uh, the idea is by testing a bunch of particles in vivo. My lab is scaling up this process dramatically at Georgia Tech right now. Um, so with that, this is the most important slide. Um, we are the lab for precision therapies at Tech. I want to thank, I have Tim, 10 lab members that have joined my lab in the last 12 months since I started at Tech. I want to thank uh, them here. I also want to thank Taylor Shaw, who's at MIT, who's uh, fantastic and a real inspiration to all of us. And I also want to thank the funding uh, at Georgia Tech that's enabled me uh, to pursue this work uh, so far. And without taking any questions. Thanks, James. Any questions? Thank you for the talk. Um, I would like to know how many particles you can test in one animal and what are the detection limits? Yeah, so the detection limits can go down to 0 0.0001 milligrams per kilogram per particle. Um, so that, that's pretty low. I think that gets us to 500 particles uh, per animal with a dose of 0 0.5 megs per keg. Uh, the scaling that we've gotten into my lab so far is a few hundred at a time. Thanks, James. It was very, very interesting. I just want to tell you that we actually looked at uh, this mixing between different types of um, nanoparticles. And we also found that with polymer, if you, are, if you have uh, polyplexes, you can have this mixing. Mm -hmm. But if you have a lipids, lipids plus um, polymer, mm -hmm. like you, your LNP, there is no mixing. It's mm -hmm. exactly the same with liposomes. That's very so this is really interesting. So uh, maybe the, uh, I mean the, the secondary, I mean the architecture, uh, must be you know uh, involved in this, and it's really interesting to create uh, to go further. Um, the question I would like to ask you: You showed you know this siRNA with uh, the, the LNP with five siRNA. Mm -hmm. I was a little bit. Um, 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 Asked to see to see that the, 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 it seems that the size of your nanoparticle seems to be the same if mm -hmm. one or five siRNA. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. So we don't we don't put five times the amount of SI into uh -huh. the particle. It's just if you have X units, sorry, X units of SI, uh -huh. you can either put one SI uh, or you can put 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 for a sum of for a sum of X units. So the the total amount of SI in the particle. Uh, when we do the multi-gene stuff, does not change. Um, so it's not like we load up five times the amount of SI. If we loaded up five times the amount of SI, the particles would likely change. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Maybe I leave. Uh... Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep, thanks. Uh, uh, excellent talk. Uh, I have two questions. One is the dynamic range of the findings you have. So what is the quantitative dynamic dyna dynamic change if you if you test that? Is it five-fold, ten-fold, or can you go up to 100-fold differences? And the second question is a more general. I was surprised to see that a single delivery of siRNA uh, can, can result in down-regulation for months. 
What is the mechanism behind that? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so to your, uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the first question? I, I apologize. The, fir the first question was the, just the dynamic range. So you showed, oh, you right. showed, you showed yeah. that you have differences in, yeah. the, in the amount of material you deliver. Yeah. But what is the dynamic range? Yeah, so the dynamic range can be uh, <clears throat> pretty, I think, dramatic. So we, we, because we normalize everything to 100% within, every sample gets normalized to 100%, the dynamic range actually change with the number of particles that you administer because you're compressing everything. Um, but you will see when you do a large screen that some particles do pretty well and many particles will drop to essentially zero. Uh, and so you'll see, you see a pretty dramatic uh, dynamic range uh, in vivo. Um, the numbers will vary depending on the number of particles that you put in because the sum always adds up to 100% no matter how many particles you put in just by our analysis. Um, and I apologize, my memory is going. What was the second question? I apologize. <laughs> I'm sorry for two questions. <laughs> uh, it's, um, it's the question why a single delivery of SI RNA nanoparticles oh, yeah. can result in several months down regulation of attack. Yeah. So the most we've gotten into endothelial cells um, is a few weeks. Um, one of the, I'd say the, the leader in robust uh, silencing for a few months at a time is right there. And, uh, they're, and they're the ones who've been getting about six months uh, after administration. And, you know, I, I think it's just a combination of fantastic delivery and fantastic RNA chemistry. Oh, very, not, uh, very nice talk. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, I just want to know uh, how do you uh, do the quality control of the barcode itself? Because, for example, if I have a thousand barcode, uh, barcode one maybe perform much better than barcode one's, uh, uh, 100. So uh, uh, first, did you observe uh, such uh, uh, such result? Mm -hmm. uh, be, uh, uh, although I know that you use regional design uh, to design a barcode, uh, I guess uh, there's still some bias, right? Sure. So yeah. so that wasn't so one of the control experiments I did not show that was in the PNS paper addressed that exact question. So we um, took uh, basically nanoparticles one through five and put barcodes one through five in them. And then we put nanoparticles one through five and put barcodes six through 10 in them. And then we co-administered uh, and saw that the barcodes did not affect delivery. Uh, we also have a bunch of uh, uh, aspects of that barcode that prevent PCR bias. So the whole sequence is not a barcode. Mm -hmm. There's actually two universal primers. Uh, and then the barcode sequence is actually very small. Mm -hmm. And so everything about the barcode is exactly the same except for a very small universal a sequence in the middle which acts as the barcode to reduce PCR bias. We also put seven random nucleotides uh, just adjacent, just to the three prime of our actual barcode. And the seven random nucleotides enable us to uh, make sure that there is no PCR runaway during the amplification. So I didn't get a chance to talk about that, but the, the barcode design took a long time um, because you had to optimize both how to amplify out a small DNA barcode and uh, reduce PCR bias. But we have very stringent controls for that. I, th I think we'll, we'll move on to the next talk, but plenty of time to speak afterwards. So thanks, James.